Greetings, and bienvenue, made crew. Thank you for returning to this broadcast. And welcome to new viewers joining us for the first time. If you like a video, then feel free to subscribe. Be me back in 2016. Turning 23, I decided to take a trip from Central Texas to Colorado Springs where my uncle lives for my birthday. October 31st. My friend Sam and I set out for Colorado on the 25 and got there on the 26th. Spend the first four days doing touristy shit going to head shops in Denver, Garden of the Gods and Pikes Peak in that order. So the night before Halloween arrived we were sitting in my uncle's backyard around a fire pit smoking. Mention that I haven't been camping in a while and my friend jumps at the opportunity and immediately starts planning a camp out for the next night. When Halloween arrives we start packing for a camping trip, throw in some blankets, a tent and some cooking supplies and flashlights. Borrowed some bear mace from my uncle and we headed out towards White River National Forest. Specifically Henry Mountain. No joke that gave me chills just typing it. We finally got up the mountain around 11 am. Campsite set up by 12 p.m. with a rock fire pit in the middle surrounded by two logs and my tent facing away from the mountain and forest. Fast forward. Nighttime I don't remember what time. We had been sitting, smoking and talking since dusk. Starts to get too cold for a Texan's blood and we go to the tent to warm up. Wake up sometime later in the dark no longer high and freezing my balls off realize we packed like idiots and are thoroughly unprepared for a night on the top of a mountain. Wake Sam and say let's go to the forerunner and sleep back there. Agrees in less than a second. I unzip the tent and take a knee to tie my boots while my friend starts gathering up the blankets and pillows. I looked at the fire pit we had made but it looked messed up like someone put an M80 in the ashes and half of the rocks from the pit were gone with no trace. I shrug it off. I feel asleep first so he probably did it while I was sleeping. Running to the forerunner from the cold I threw in the blankets and pillows. Sam jumped in and I closed the hatch. An hour later my friend is snoring and I feel wide awake. I can't get the fire pit out of my head. It was so uncharacteristic of my him he wouldn't mess with the fire pit it we spent the afternoon making. I eventually give up and decided to have a smoke so I moved to the driver's seat by just crawling from the back. I take a look around and it's nothing but darkness. It was like my windshield had become a portal to the abyss. I put a headphone in my right ear and grab my pipe to start loading it when I hear something. Pause the music and lean forward using my arm against the door to steady myself. I was listening for anything out of the norm and my friend's snoring didn't help so I pushed his head and he kinda woke up. I heard him ask if I was smoking. I hand him the pipe and say shut the hell up and listen. Suddenly I heard a click. Sam had heard it too. I could see the reaction on his face. I turned back to look and put my arm back against the door. Then I felt it in my right arm. A slight vibration in the door every time I heard a click then it hit me someone was trying to open my door. Immediately a million thoughts run through my head in a second the first one was fuck. Feel it happen two more times and just sorta watch my door. In the span of five seconds right after the second pull the door behind me was pulled then the hatch then the back right and finally the passenger side door. I was shocked and speechless like never before. I had seen nothing and it happened so fast. I remember this cold feeling in the pit of my stomach as I looked at the passenger window. As I was looking at the window all of them were practically black so I couldn't see anything but I heard three small but definite taps. That's fucking enough I said out loud. I turned to my friend and told him to hand me the keys. As I did they realized we were in the car not the tent flick on the headlights and feel my hope die a little. Twenty plus people in the forest and around our tent. One of them was pouring gas on our tent, a few others were pulling up the tent spikes. For a second they were frozen like deer in the headlights and I wondered how long they watched us for. 
throw my car in reverse and go down the mountain so fast that somewhere along the way I broke the exhaust on my forerunner. On the way down I realized they were going to light the tent on fire and drag it off the cliff. Spoke to the police but they found nothing, not even our tent and cooking shit. Had my uncle weld my exhaust and I left for Texas that afternoon. Haven't been back to cursed Colorado since. OC experience driving through the desert at night. Drove cross country last week Great Lakes to SoCal. Past the Colorado truck way station 20 miles back. Nothing between there and the Utah border. Come around an S-shaped curve after dipping into a valley. Headlights are pointed out into the desert for a moment. There is a dude standing along the side of the road. Dark skin, dark hair looks Mexican or Native American. Wearing an orange shirt and tan shorts slash pants has something white and round in his hand plastic bag or hard hat. He is waving the white lump at traffic, us, but casually not like he was trying to flag down a car. Wife confirms she sees this, also points out there is no broken down car and we are 20 miles from the nearest anything. I'm too spooked to stop because real skinwalkers. Decide to look for the next mile marker and call it in to the cop 6 slash point 6 for those wondering. No cell reception and a sign telling us next services 116 miles. Tell this story to an older friend, she is nodding along as I describe him. Oh yeah, I've seen him. He is there to remind people to be cautious around road construction crews. Good thing he was waving. I've heard of him appearing in the back seat of cars of people he felt were driving unsafely. Hey gents. Glad to be here. Never thought I would have enough courage to post on this website but I want some answers, and wish to share an interesting story that happened last weekend. So without further ado, here you go. Be me. Plan a two-day camping trip on the Grand Mesa. Get four others to come with, especially a sweet young lady I'm glued to plus her little puppy. Figured fuck it and be a goober for a few days. Fast forward to the first day on the mountain. Camping spot is completely away from everyone else because, in a woods. I'm sort of a per Kelvin, fanatic. Keep that in mind. Keep two firearms with me. A small .22 Bearcat revolver. And a Sig Sauer M400. My lady holds the revolver for me and my other buddies are corn-feed country boys, so I expected a shotgun, and a bolt rifle of some sort. We spent the first day creeping the woods and plinking at squirrels and such. Come across a bedding area, full of bones and shit. WTF.JPG. Call my boys up and we all shit bricks. I converse with my goons for a sec until my oldest buddy, who I will call, Jay looks at me and says. Fuck me to tears, this thing puts down at dinner time. Laugh like a dumbass and trudge back down to camp. First night, I'm laying down with my old lady and the puppy at my feet. Start to hear some sneaky feet down by the creek. Heavy as fuck. Puppy's ears prick up and he starts barking. I slap him on his ass to shut him up. Footsteps stop. I'm shitting myself. My lady starts to freak out. Hates cryptid, ghost stories. I tell her to just hang out and I'll check it out. I grab my gat, and slowly peek through the mesh on my tent. See eyes reflecting the light from the fire outside. Oh fuck dot mp4. I duck down and say nothing to the homegirl. WTF, did you see Anon? Nothing. I thought I saw something. I need to put out the fire. I'll be right back. Pick up a flashlight and hammer and unzip the tent. Instantly shine light in the direction I saw eyes. First night. Once I shine my light over where I saw the eyes. I almost shit myself. Not a damn thing. 
kind of sad because I wanted to go full psycho on the motherfucker and dump a 30 rounder into it. My buddy J and B come out of their tent guns in hand. Anon, what the fuck are you doing? Relay the story to them. Both go wide-eyed as a bitch. The nope off back to the tent no questions asked. WTF.MP3 go back to the tent and go to sleep. Go back to bed and sleep it off. Day 2. We go hiking. Pack up a day pack and strap our rifles to our bags. Go deep in the woods. 20 miles from the campsite. Rocky road to hiking trail. There is fucking nothing out here but mile markers and old hunting camps. Get to trailhead and start out trek. Rather enjoyable hike. I ate some ravioli like a champ and took some lovely pictures. Coming back down the hill and I begin to take in my surroundings. Notice giant fuck off. Missing 411 inspired. Boulder field right next to the trail halfway. Fuck all that noise. Look to my left and you want fucking believe this shit. A. Fucking. Staircase. Heart drops and my nuts shove up my stomach. Now I know all about these fucking things. They are the bane of everything I hate. I'm from Alaska, in the southern region near Fairbanks. Lived in the woods most of my life, a staircase. I know not to even trudge up to them or even touch them. Buddy notices it and asks me about it cause I'm visibly shaken up. I tell him to shut up and keep going. We reach the trucks and leave. Tell girlfriend about the stairs, and she has a conniption fit. Why the fuck would you not touch it? Tell her about them and forget about it. Second night. I'm half asleep when coyotes decide to have a fucking electronic dance music concert over on the other side of the clearing. Loud as f.mp3. Listen in for about 15 minutes before. Lo and behold. I hear a fucking doozy of a scream below from the neighboring hill. Shatters my ears. Sounds like one of those hunters from left 4 dead. Shit literal bricks. I grab my gat and hop out the tent and so do my boys. We all run to our trucks and turn them on. Lights on full. Decide to chase the fucking thing out of here despite being scared shit less. Get to the top of the hill and fucking see nothing. Flashlights and all. Look down at the campsite and see not a thing. Hear the scream again from the stream about 400 feet from camp. Oh fuck, run down the hill at full sprint, popping rounds in the area I heard it. Thwomp, I fucking hit it, scream gets belligerent and loud. The motherfucker screams all the way back to the tree line. At about that time I got a good glance at it in the moonlight. It's average build, I'd say around 6 foot. Too dark to see any normal details. Motherfucker can hoof it too. Broke 100 yards in about 10 seconds. We ran back down to camp to check in. Girlfriend's shaken up. So am I I stay outside the tent all night alongside my boys. No sleep gang. Pack up the next morning and leave. Halfway on the drive back home I realize that I fucking shot a cryptid. I shot a fucking cryptid. Badass.jpg. Can't wait to tell my kids this one, but I hope you boys enjoyed it. I'll leave it up to interpretation. Believe what you want to believe, and so will I. The Slide Rock Bolter, Macrostoma saxiperumptus, is a bizarre creature recounted by the lumberjacks of North America during the 19th and early 20th centuries. It is believed to live in the mountains of Colorado, but this beast only lived in the mountains where the slope was more than a 45 degree angle. It has an immense head, with small eyes, and a large mouth. It has a tail ending in a fluke like a dolphin, with enormous grab hooks. All day long this creature will just wait for a tourist or helpless creature below it. At the right moment, it will lift its tail, thus loosening its hold on the mountain, and descend rapidly down the slope. 
with the beast's mouth wide open it would swallow all that got in its way. Whole parties of tourists are reported to have been gulped up in one scoop by taking parties far back into the hills. Its body is also so large and strong that trees in its path are broken and destroyed. Its own impetus carries it up the next slope, where it again slaps its tail over the ridge and waits. In the mountains of Colorado, where in some of the wood are becoming infested with tourists, much uneasiness has been caused by the presence of the slide rock bolter. This frightful animal lives only in the steepest mountain country where the slopes are greater than 45 degrees. It has an immense head, with small eyes, and a mouth somewhat on the order of a sculpin, running back beyond its ears. The tail consists of a divided flipper, with enormous grab hooks, which it fastens over the crest of the mountain or ridge, often remaining there motionless for days at a time, watching the gulfs for tourists or any other hapless creature that may enter it. At the right moment, after sighting a tourist, it will lift its tail, thus loosening its hold on the mountain, and with its small eyes riveted on the poor unfortunate, and drooling thin skid grease from the corners of its mouth, which greatly accelerates its speed, the bolter comes down like a toboggan, scooping in its victim as it goes, its own impetus carrying it up the next slope, where it again slaps its tail over the ridge and waits. Whole parties of tourists are reported to have been gulped at one scoop by taking parties far back into the hills. The animal is a menace not only to tourists but to the woods as well. Many a draw through spruce-covered slopes has been laid low, the trees being knocked out by the roots or mowed off as by a scythe where the bolter has crashed down through from the peaks above. A forest ranger, whose district includes the rough county between Offer Peaks and the Lizard Head, conceived the bold idea of decoying a slide rock bolter to its own destruction. A dummy tourist was rigged up with a plaid Norfolk jacket, knee breeches, and a guidebook to Colorado. It was then filled full of giant powder and fulminate caps and posted in a conspicuous place, where, sure enough, the next day it attracted the attention of a bolter which had been hanging for days on the slope of Lizard Head. The resulting explosion flattened half the buildings in Rico, which were never rebuilt, and the surrounding hills fattened flocks of buzzards the rest of the summer. B2006 in Colorado. Fresh out of high school. Parents demand I college up or move out. Can't decide which direction I want to take with life, opt for the move out. Parents are honestly pretty cool about it, besides the kicking me out thing. No money for rent, no friends with extra space. Ask the extended family for help. Crazy ass uncle lives out in the country in a little ranch house. Haven't seen him since I was 12. Apparently he has social anxiety and has panic attacks in crowded areas, so he moved out to the country. I still thought he was cool. Didn't even think to call him, but my other uncle informed him of my predicament. He calls me. Anon. It's been so long. You were always my favorite nephew. Heard you had to move out. Good news. I'm going on vacation for a few months. But I need someone to house sit for me. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. There's $5,000 in it for you. Plus a roof over your head for a few months. Holy shit. What? Yeah. Think of it as payment, and a late graduation present. You're gonna have to spend some of it on groceries, though. Like the good little boy that I am. I unquestioningly agree with the mention of money. Pack some clothes, some toiletries and shit. Parents agree to let me keep the rest of my shit in the house for now. Head out into the ranch-tastic part of the state. Arrive three days after the call with minimal baggage. Uncle is in full mountain man mode. Huge bushy beard, six foot four, layers of fat and muscle. We hug, kind of uncomfortably, he thanks me, congratulates me on graduating, offers some financial and life advice while he shows me around the house and grounds, and we talk for a few hours. Now, about the house. Let's get down to business.jpg. Haven't had an animal bigger than a dog on this property for nearly five years. Honestly, I'm just living here for the scenery and isolation. So no animal care to deal with. There's a few stray cats, but they fend for themselves and don't hurt anything, so just leave them be. If there's no animals and no neighbors, why do you even need a house sitter? 
Oh, there's always nosy kids looking for kicks. Another word for Latinos. Uncomfortably laugh off the blatant racism. Then, they're the raccoons. Digging through the trash, shitting on the porch. You want to scare him off whenever you can. Oh, thank God, he isn't talking about black people. There hasn't been anything else weird, except. Oh no, here comes the but. But. God damn it. Some stuff will sometimes get moved around or carried away from the house. Garbage lids, shovels, old farming equipment. It's no big deal. Just don't freak out if you wake up and see a shovel laying out on the edge of the woods. Ha ha. Yeah, ha ha. He leaves that night. Night one. I sleep in a guest bedroom by the back door. Hear some rummaging around. Figure it's just the raccoons. Yell at them. Rummaging stops. Sleep peacefully. Day one. Wake up the next morning. All the shovels and shit that were in the shed. The door to which was shut tight, but not locked, are scattered around the front yard. A few even stuck into the earth. Figured it was just the uncle trying to fuck with me before he left. Stick tools back in the shed. Actually lock it up. Clean up the mess by the garbage bins, presumably left by raccoons. Other than that, uneventful. Night 2. Decide to stay up a little later, watch a movie or two. Check uncle's DVD library. Nothing but Bob Ross's The Joy of Painting, DVDs and films made by either Michael Bay or M. Night Shama Lama Ding Dong. Fuck it. Decide to watch signs. In the middle of the movie, around 11, I hear the rummaging again. Freaks me out. Then regain my grasp on reality and shout at the stupid goddamn raccoons. Rummaging stops. A minute later, it starts up again. Shout again. Ignored. Grab a broom from the closet. Pause signs. Muster my courage and swing the back door open, wildly swinging the broom and wailing. Forgot to turn on the porch light first. Oh shit. JPG. Trip on some trash. Stumble forward and bash head on the porch banister. Garbage bin lids clatter to the floor. Hear something scurry off into the night. Regain composure, curse loudly, turn on light. Garbage is neatly piled beside the bins. Think to myself, these are some police ass raccoons. Put garbage back in bins, get some ice for my head. Go back inside, finish the signs, fall asleep. Day 2. Wake up, make some cereal. I notice the back door is open slightly. Could have sworn I shut it last night, but I don't remember locking it. Shut it tight this time, watch some cartoons in the living room, then gear up for a grocery run. Outside, the shovels are all lined up against the side of the shed. The shed door is shut. Lock still securely in place. What the fuck? Have a minor freak out. Eventually rationalize that there must be a hobo or something borrowing or stealing from the shed. It gets pretty cold at night, maybe he sleeps in there. But how'd he get inside? The door was locked. Examine the shed. The sheet metal that makes up the back wall came loose at the right corner. You could lift it up and head right in. Nail it shut again. Unlock shed. Return shovels. Lock shed back up again. Go back to the house. Make sure everything's locked up, tight. Good to go. Head to the closest grocery store. Cashier makes small talk. Mention I'm house sitting for uncle name here. Cashier gets real quiet. What's wrong? I ask. Expect some bullshit local legend about his ranch being an Indian burial ground. No offense, but your uncle is really, really racist. And kind of an asshole. My sigh of relief disturbed him. Yeah, I know, but he's family. I say. Besides, I think there's a homeless guy living on the property, so someone has to watch the place. Cashier gives me a funny look. Homeless? Is that weird? Well, kinda. For one thing, there's a homeless shelter in town that's well stocked, and if any of those craziest rednecks out in the ranch land caught a hobo on their property, they'd probably shoot him on sight. 
Shrug it off as the guy having a bias against farmers and ranchers. Return to the ranch, nothing happens for the rest of the week. The rest of week one was uneventful, not even any rummaging or tool scattering. Occasionally, when I was doing chores on the grounds or just hanging around outside, I got the eerie feeling I was being watched. I wrote it off as owls, cats, or maybe that hobo from before. I arrived on a Sunday, I guess I should specify. So, night one is Sunday night, day one is Monday, night two is Monday night, day two is Tuesday etc, etc. Realized that might confuse some people, so I felt the need to explain. It wasn't for five or so more days that weird shit picked up again. Night 8. Been getting more at home in the ranch, exploring other rooms, exercising in the exercise room, eating in the dining room, the place feels nice and homey. That day I noticed the stray cats that my uncle had mentioned. They lived in a little dilapidated farmhouse on the edge of the property. Probably fed on mice or voles or some shit. I love cats, and I'm an idiot, so just before nightfall, I leave a saucer of milk by the front door. That night, I'm packing it in after a nice bubble bath, ready to hit the hay, when the rummaging returns, with a vengeance. It's louder than before, at first, then quiets down. Still, I can hear it. Just barely. Thoroughly tired of the coons collective shit, I decide to go spook these motherfuckers. Brace myself by the back door. In one skillful motion. Flip on the porch light, throw myself out of the door, expecting the coons to scurry out into the field. Rummaging stops. No bin clatter. No scurrying. Pause for a minute, then lower the rifle and look at the bins. The lids are neatly placed on the porch banister. Most of the trash is still in the bins. Except. Except for some plastic bottles, some aluminum cans, and a newspaper. All the stuff I usually separated out of the trash to put in the recycling bins. I had been lazy that day and probably missed some stuff. Glance around the grounds, taking in what I can see in the halo of the porch light. Nothing. No coons, no cats, no hobos. I clean up the bins, stick the recyclables in the recycling bins, then lock them up for the night. I don't sleep very well that night. Day 8. Still thoroughly spooked by last night's garbage rummage. Shakily bathe myself, eat a nice pancake and hash brown breakfast, watch the news, pretty much do as much normal stuff as I can to calm myself down. Around 11 in the morning, I decide to get some chores done. Open the front door. Forgot about my milk saucer from night 8. It's empty. Sweet, I think, the cats came close to the house. I take the saucer in, and do my chores. Take out trash, separate recyclables, clean out the shed of any dust or trash, make sure nothing's leaking so nothing rusts. Clean the lawn of debris, wash my uncle's boat. Only had to do that once a week, but he specified that he really wanted it done, so I obliged. Swing by the rickety ass farmhouse. Been too spooked to check it out up until now. Besides, the place looks like it could collapse at any time. Cautiously open the door. Just dirt, some weeds, and a bunch of rotten wood and rusted old tools. Not a cat to be seen or heard. Or an owl. Or a rat or mouse or vole. That strikes me as somewhat odd. Other than that, the day went well and I put out another saucer of milk at the end of it. For the cats. Night 9 enjoying the soothing sounds and calm demeanor of Bob Ross. When suddenly, the rummaging 3, revenge of the rummaging, completely shakes me out of my happy place. Get kind of mad, honestly. I my uncle's gun cabinet. There's only an old rifle in there. He used it to scare off or take down coyotes and shit when there were still animals on the ranch, apparently. It's just a .22 LR varmint rifle. I think. It's unloaded, but well maintained. There's some ammo for it. Decide against it. Figure pulling a gun on imaginary ghosts is one step too close to the deep end. Flick the back porch light on and off and scream. Rummaging stops. 
Again, no bin clatter. No scurrying. Wait a minute. It starts up again. Sigh heavily. Audibly say, come on guys, just fuck off already. Rummaging stops again. Quiet. Very faint sounds, kind of like running water? I guess. Then, the lids bang down. I hear tiny movements that slowly fade away. My eyes are wide as dinner plates as I hang out by the back door for 10, maybe 20 minutes, losing my mind. It fucking heard me. It heard me and it understood me and it wasn't a fucking person and it sure as hell wasn't a goddamned raccoon. Finally peek out onto the porch. The lids are on the bins. Shut the door tight. Lock it. Then lock it again, just to make sure. I toss and turn all night, imagining tiny fucking homeless gremlins rummaging through my trash. Day 9 the morning was hard for me, and I'm not just talking about my dick. I tried my best to pretend nothing happened, that nothing was weird, but I just couldn't do it. I ended up making another run into town. I didn't even do any of my chores before leaving. As I left the ranch, I noticed the milk saucer was cleaned out again. I smile, and imagine how stoked the cats must be to get some fresh cow juice. My mind turns for a minute and suddenly I'm imagining little fucking goblins slurping up the shit as they keep the cats at bay. Shake it off, and even refill the saucer before I take off. I buy some more supplies, some more food, and even rent a few new DVDs. Bob's great and all, but I needed some stronger escapism. I talk to pretty much everybody. It's only been a week and a half, but I feel like staying up there on the ranch all alone was making me go stir crazy. I end up staying in town for a few hours, just wandering around. When I get back in the car, I realize I'm anxious. I'm legitimately frightened of spending another night at the ranch house. Call myself a pussy bitch, since I am one, and psyche myself up for the return. You feel great, everything's fine, and even if there were little hobo elves going through your trash and drinking milk, who gives a shit, they're Americans, and that's their business. Laugh a little and head back up to the ranch. The milk's still in the saucer. I left it out, disappointed. Stock the house up. Break out a bottle of whiskey from my uncle's liquor cabinet. He said I could have one, just one. I'd had a drink or two before, but never really gotten drunk. Figure it's about time that changed. Night 10. Honestly, I don't remember this night too well. I drank three or four shots of whiskey. Had a swig of it straight from the mouth, just to see how it felt. Ended up drinking about a fifth or fourth of the bottle. I watched Meet the Fockers. That movie was goddamned awful, but I remember laughing at it. I passed out halfway through, whiskey still open, lights still on. Day 10. Clean up the couch and living room. Popcorn everywhere, whiskey spilled, drool all over the cushions. Feel like an ass. Also feel like shit, really irritating headache, mouth dry as hell, sore throat, and sore joints from sleeping in a stupid position. Get done. Decide to pick up on my chores. Open the front door, milk saucer is emptied. Makes sense, cats are nocturnal. Only seen them once or twice during the day. Oh well, back to chores. No reason to take the trash to the curb. Garbage collectors won't be here for another three or four days. Clear branches and shit out of the lawn. Notice it's getting kind of long, make a note to mow it. Carry branches and twigs to the edge of the wooded area out back of the house. Turn my back, when I get goosebumps. Feels like I'm being watched. Turn into the woods. The sensation stops. I don't see anything. I relax for a minute, before realizing that I don't see anything at all. There's no owls or birds in the trees, no insects, no rodents. The only animal noises sound like they're coming from maybe a quarter mile away. Notice a little clearing in the woods. Just a few yards in. Stumble through the woods. There's a fairy ring in the dead center of it. A perfect circle of mushrooms. I get the being watched sensation again. Clear the fuck out of there, panicking slightly. Regain composure, head out to shed. Shovels lined up by the side. No. I yell in my own head. No. 
You don't get to. I don't remember whether I shouted out loud or just thought really angrily in my own head. Lock still on the shed door. Circle around back. The open flap was there again, and the nails I used to seal it up were stacked in a neat pile beside the shed. God damn it. Pick up nails, put shovels in the shed. Freak out. Head back into the house. Don't leave for the rest of the day. For the rest of the week I barely leave the house. I just didn't feel safe anymore. I watch movies, watch the news, and eat. Whenever I was out there, I felt watched. I was really unhappy and considered bailing on my uncle, or maybe not doing the chores, but decided against it. He gave me 5,000 fucking dollars and I was gonna do my goddamn job. I perform my chores with maximum efficiency. I spend no unnecessary time outside. I take out the trash when it needs to go out, clean the shed, wash his boat, and clean the lawn of debris. The only thing I don't do is take the twigs and branches out to the woods. I just can't bring myself to go out there. I pile them up off the back porch. The only events that occur are rummaging on the back porch every few nights. And every time it happens, I eye the rifle and have to talk myself out of loading it and firing randomly into the dark off the back porch. During this time, I slowly drink the rest of the whiskey. I even consider opening a new bottle, but manage to control myself. Eventually, I realize I haven't left milk out for the cats in a while. I imagine the little kitties out there with whatever the fuck else was out there. I imagine them thirsty or hungry. I can't deal with that guilt. On day 15 or so, I decide it must be done. I leave out a saucer of milk. The night is uneventful. That morning, I got ready for my maximally efficient chore run. I open the front door. Sitting there, piled neatly beside the empty milk saucer, is a bunch of shiny pebbles, bottle caps, and random coins. Day 15. The previously stated happens, but I'm more confused and curious than scared this time. Something about receiving what seems like compensation for the milk made me think that whatever I was dealing with had some sort of almost human rationality to it, assuming something spoopy was actually happening. Which I honestly did at the time. I don't let it get to me. I do my chore run. Eventually get to the shed. I had been putting it off, worried about what might be there. The answer was, nothing. No shovels, no anything. I checked the back of the shed. I had nailed it up again about two days after my shovel freakout. Nails still in place. I sit there for a minute, then decide something more drastic must be done. I end up spending two hours soldering the flap in place and making sure there are no other weaknesses in the structure. Then, I walk around the edge of the property. I examine the farmhouse, the wooded area, old, discarded equipment, whatever I can find. There's no sign of a human dicking with any of it. Aside from the sticks I chucked into the woods, the whole perimeter seemed to have been untampered with for years. No broken twigs, no stamped down earth, no adjusted branches, no turned over equipment. I head back to the house and leave out another saucer of milk. Then, I sat by the front door, pull up a chair, and wait. Night 15. I stay up all night. All fucking night. I only leave to use the bathroom, or make myself a pot of coffee. Early on, I have a moment of brilliance. I get some flour from the pantry. Take a deep breath and open the door. Milk saucer still full. Not a cat, rat, or fucking hobgoblin in sight. I sprinkle flour all over the porch. I mean fucking everywhere. The rest of the time, I sit there, in still silence, and I listen. I hear owls hooting far away, and rustling of trees in the wind. No crickets, though. I jump at every louder than average hoot and every gust of wind. All night, I sit there and wait. Sunrise comes. I stand up and I am nerve-wracked, and tired. I open the door. Milk saucer empty? Check. Pile of random shiny crap? Nope. But one thing was off about the porch. The flower was gone. I don't mean like the wind shifted it or something. I mean it was completely gone, cleaned off the porch, without a trace. 
I didn't leave the door alone for more than four or five minutes at any time. They didn't make a goddamned sound, and they didn't leave a fucking trace. Day 16. I don't go back to sleep. I do my chores, then make a supply run into town. Supply run is uneventful. Return is, too. In fact, the rest of my stay is almost completely uneventful. I don't leave out any more milk. I leave no chores undone or incomplete. I separate the recycling. The rummaging happens every few nights, and when it does I remain silent and let it or them or whatever the fuck have its way with the trash. The next morning, the back porch is always clean of debris, and the trash bins are exactly how I left them. The shed remains unmolested. The porch is left largely alone. I make supply runs as frequently and for as long as I can. I end up spending extended periods of time in town, just dicking around wherever people will have me. It's refreshing, and it's the only time I don't feel like a fucking crazy person. The return always fills me with dread, since I still feel almost perpetually watched on the grounds, but I always go back. Uncle even calls to check in. I tell him everything's fine, except that some weird stuff had happened with the shed. He says it must be a really dedicated hobo, and that he'll have the sheriff check it out when he gets back. Best just to ignore it and lock up tight every night. Yeah, I say, nonchalantly. Only one other creepy thing happened. But it was what fucking broke me and made me swear to myself that I wasn't coming back to that fucking ranch ever again. Day 50-ish? I have become the ultimate automaton. All I do while I'm on the grounds is do chores, eat, and watch Scrubs, Seinfeld, and Bob Ross, then I go to sleep. I've started calling out to the cats when I see them. I coax them towards me with slices of chicken or turkey. They never come close enough to pet, but sometimes I leave the sandwich meat down, and walk away, then get to watch them take it. There's three or four cats that all look kind of similar. I like them, but they're probably close to feral, and shouldn't be treated like pets. Too bad I'm an idiot. I manage to coax one within arm's reach of me, and offer it, the turkey. It takes it, and I am so fucking stoked. I reach out to scratch it behind the ear. As soon as I touch it, it flips the fuck out, and claws my hand. I bolt straight up and yell, and kick at the cat. I should have seen that coming, I know, and it's not the cat's fault, but I was pissed. I curse and scream about rabies as the cat darts off towards the old farmhouse. I feel bad for the rest of the day. The guilt really gets to me. I resolve to leave some milk out one last time, this time right next to the barn to make sure the cats get to it before, whatever has been digging through my trash and leaving me shekels does. In the evening, I leave the milk next to the barn. I check on it every once in a while through the kitchen window, but the cat never comes out. Night 51-ish, wasn't eventful. Day 51 was when I couldn't take it anymore. Day 51. I open the front door. There's the cat, the same cat that scratched me the day before. It's laying on the edge of the porch with its head crushed in. There's no blood on the porch or the walkway or in the grass. I puke. I freak out. I grab the rifle, load it and scream off the front porch for an hour, aiming it at anything that rustles or moves but never pulling the trigger. Finally, I calm down. I head to the shed to get a shovel to dig it a grave. There's a hammer propped up against the edge of the shed. Completely clean. I check by the farmhouse. The milk saucer's empty again. I slept with the rifle loaded and within arm's reach for the rest of my stay there. That was it. Sorry if you're dissatisfied with it. I rushed out the ending post because people were getting really antsy in anticipation. I slept with the rifle the rest of the stay. My uncle came back eight or so days later. I told him what happened. He still blamed a hobo, but he was shocked and said he'd go to the police as soon as possible. I don't think he ever did. I got my 5,000 though. The experience fucked me up, though, and I haven't told anyone else in my family or friend circle about it for fear of them recommending psychological help. 
I know it wasn't as dramatic or drastic as some of the other stories you hear about, creepy, supernaturalish things. Everything that happened probably could be explained by animals and one very persistent hobo. But the feeling, the feeling I had during my stay there made everything feel fantastical and unreal, and it was frightening. I've never gone back, but I still talk to my uncle reasonably frequently. We've never talked about the incidents during my stay there, especially not about the cat. The closest we ever came was about a week after I left, and rented an apartment in my hometown. He called me and asked how well I thought I'd soldered the back of the shed. I told him pretty well, I sat around for two hours making sure it held. He told me it opened up again. I know that. Whatever it was, be it hobo, goblin, fairy, or fucking recycle cobra, was trying to help me. I recognize that it appeared to be doing me favors, and when I look back on it, I know I overreacted and regretted not doing something. Experimenting, I guess, but it was so unsettling at the time. I'm pretty much a normie. I don't do scary stuff besides occasionally browsing, x. Being waited on by some seemingly invisible force in exchange for saucers of milk was interesting, but fucking scary. It was something unknown, so I panicked. When it killed the cat, I realized that it was, my fault. I got the cat killed. I don't blame whatever the hell lives out there, I just don't want it anywhere near me because if it can misunderstand my anger and attempt at penance for, he wants me to beat that furry creature to death with a hammer, and I will do this, because we are friends. Then I don't want to be responsible for any more misunderstandings, it and I have. I have a cabin in buttfuck nowhere Colorado I decided to go up to for a couple of weeks. No internet. A single landline phone state-of-the-art for the 1980s. On Wednesday, April 10th, Colorado had a blizzard. It wasn't too bad in cities but where I was it was horrible. That's all the background you need to know. Be sitting in my cabin stoking the fire during buttfuck blizzard. Hanging out and watching some DVDs on a CRT older than father time himself since I can't go outside. Constant howling of the wind. Turn up the volume. Eventually get up to piss so I pause the movie. Wind is no longer howling. Didn't notice since the TV was blasting. Find it strange since it's been doing it for four hours now thank fuck it's over. Take a few steps until I hear it. Click. Look around. I literally have never heard this clicking noise and I've been up there for five months now. Click. Realize it's coming from outside. A branch probably snapped and hit my cabin and is rocking back and forth or some shit. Fuck me I'm not going outside I can deal with the noise. Standing in the bathroom. Begin to piss. Click. Annoyed. Finish up. Walk outside the bathroom. Click. Realize there's no consistency to the clicking sound. I can't even expect it. It happens whenever. Sit back down and continue to watch a movie. Turn the volume down since the wind isn't howling. Clicking speeds up. Multiple times a minute. Fuck it all go take a nap or something on the other side of the cabin so I can't hear it. Walk into the bedroom clicking begins. My bedroom is like 50 feet from where the TV is but the click is just as loud like it's fucking following me. Try to ignore it and go to sleep. The inconsistency of the clicking breaks me. Throw on snow gear time to fuck up this branch for making me go outside. Walk to the door and brace myself. Open it swiftly and feel old man winter fuck me up the ass. Quickly walk out and shut the door. Walk around the cabin in blinding snow looking for a branch like an idiot. Make multiple laps and can't find the asshole. Assume it finally got loose and flew away. Go back inside. No clicking. Feels good man. JPG. Go to take that nap in peace. Fall into a deep slumber. Wake up at about 2 p.m. Click noises. 
start to feel uneasy. Don't give it a second thought and I throw on snow gear. Go outside. No branches. No howling. No nothing. Go back inside and go from mad to upset because I can't figure out what the fuck the sound is. Click noises. Walk to different rooms to try and escape it. Click noises. How the fuck is it following me throughout the cabin? Moment of realization. It's not coming from the sides of the cabin. It's coming from the roof. All rational thought has gone out the window from the sound of this fucking clicking snow gear and walk outside. The storm has calmed down for now but it's still foggy. Can only see like 20 feet ahead of you. Walk around back and grab my ladder. Prop that shit up. This ends now. Begin to climb up the ladder and stop. I could only hear the clicking inside. Even over the howl of the wind. Defcon 2, X, warned me about this. Climb up high enough to be able to see the top of the roof. At the top I see a pale figure. Heart stops. Defcon 1. The figure is hunched over. It's sickly thin and I can see its spine. It's angled where it can't see me but I can see it. See it moving slightly. Look slightly down and see it has, on hand, a fingernail that's probably six inches long. Literally just tapping the roof. It stops. It slowly turns its head to me. Black eyes and small slit for mouth. No facial features besides that. Almost like a crude drawing of a fucking alien. It begins to stand up. By the way, it's true. Your life does flash before your eyes when you think you're about to die. It stands up staring at me. Probably five feet tall give or take. Walks to the edge of the roof of the cabin never taking its eyes off me. Hops down on the ground. I can see it land and it slowly backs away into the fog towards the trees. Never stops locking eyes with me. Petrified. Probably didn't move for five minutes, or at least felt like it, in the blistering cold gripping a ladder. Snap out of it. Climb down the ladder carefully. Don't even bother to take it down. I realize I'm in shock. Calmly walk around the cabin and go inside. Walk around the house and turn off the lights and put out the fire. Grab keys and walk out. Don't bother grabbing anything else besides my wallet next to my keys. Storm has picked back up, but I literally am in some kind of trance I don't even notice. Close the door and don't bother locking it. Slowly walk to the car. Open the door. Get in. Start it. And swing around. Still in shock I drive for hours until I reach a motel. Shock is wearing off and I can feel myself ready to fucking go crazy. Quickly get a room and now I start feeling adrenaline and rush up to my room. Open it and close it and start freaking the fuck out over what I saw. For a few hours I was freaking out in the hotel room, calmed down, and slept for about 16 hours. I drove back up to the cabin. Fucking bolted inside and grabbed my phone ran out and locked the door, and got in the truck and sped off. After reading all the stories on, X, I was more surprised than anything that I didn't immediately flip out, but just went into shock for hours. I got home a few hours ago after driving for a while and stopping multiple times to breath and not flip out again. I think one thing people forget to mention is that fear comes in waves, It'd be driving and be totally okay. Then suddenly it would hit me and I'd have to pull over and just sit in my car while I calmed the fuck down and didn't drive like a paranoid schizo or something. Came home and made myself a drink and typed all this out. Don't know what I'm going to do with the cabin. Don't care right now. Night assholes. Thanks for listening. Oh, and no. I didn't smell blood or copper. Grab some guns and friends and go cryptid hunting. 
I guess I'll respond to this one since I went to brush my teeth and just came back to turn off my computer. Fuck that man. These people who say they try and hunt these creatures after seeing them are LARPing. I have zero desire to try to and fuck with that abomination. I'm not about to risk my life or people I love on some fucking meme hunt for a creature I believe is intelligent. This isn't hunting a deer. It's not like a deer will come attack you while you're walking through the forest. It's like hunting another hunter who knows the woods better than you can, and obviously can climb since he was on my cabin. Don't believe these fuckers on here who say they stayed and tried to kill it or whatever. No man would ever see something like that and think to stick around. Alright. I've had a few more drinks tonight but I'll do my best. Basically like a skeleton with skin. I mean pale as fuck. You could see its rip cage and hip bones. It was like an anorexic person. There wasn't any dark colors on it besides its eyes and tiny slit of a mouth. The eyes were smaller, almost human-like, but were circles and not the traditional eye shape. Around the size of a half dollar, American obviously. The mouth was just a slit. It didn't give me a gay toothy grin or whatever. It was just a slit the horizontal across where a mouth would be. No lips though. Like imagine someone curling their lips into their mouth and you can see a little gap. Only its right hand had the long nail on its index. It looked like a long ass human nail but almost sharpened, with the tip being like the end of a knife. That's about it. Like I said, anorexic person with no facial features. It also wasn't that tall. It was skinny but not lanky like proportion to its size but still sickly looking. Hope this helps. The image isn't burned into my mind because the shock set in and I was basically running on autopilot. Up here. I figured you fucks would ask. So I did the best I could to draw out what it looked like when it turned to me. My father grew up in a pretty small town in Colorado. His mom passed when he was still young, so it was just him, his sister, and their dad. Everyone knew each other in the town, so they had free range to go anywhere with no real worry. They used to fish at a pond near their house quite often, but their dad told them to not stay out after dark. They usually listened until my dad was about 15 or so and his sister was 13. They decided to stay out a little later. My dad said they didn't stay out till it was completely dark, but the sun had definitely set and it was past the no shadows hour that comes when the sun is gone, but there is still a little light. They started walking home. My dad said in an instant he felt this weird feeling over him, but for some reason did not question it. Like as if your entire body got really warm and you were hyper alert, but at the same time extremely tired. Not sleepy tired, but as if he just ran super far. He looked around and noticed he was on the road and not on the trail anymore. Like, in an instant. He was covered in sweat and his heart was racing. His shoes were missing, socks were filthy and the legs of his jeans were torn up as if he ran through a thorn bush. He had a few cuts on him all over his body like he fell a few times. He tried to understand what just happened. How did he make that 30-minute walk back and not remember what happened? He said after, an embarrassing amount of time, he realized his sister wasn't with him. He looked back the way he came and saw there was no trail behind him. He just ran straight to the road, not even minding the trail. He decided to walk back the way he came to look for her. It was dark, by this time. He walked back, yelling out her name, trying to find her. After a while he couldn't see where he was going or where he had been. He started to panic afraid something happened to his sister, and he was so afraid he ran away. At this point, he was screaming and crying her name. He ended up sitting on the ground where he was and just cried. He cried himself to sleep and ended up waking up early in the morning, before the sun had risen. He was able to see now, and got a good look at himself. He was a mess. He quickly remembered his sister, and started yelling for her again. 
He didn't even know where he was so he just started walking till he was finally able to find the pond. He started to walk the trail up to the road. Halfway up the trail, he saw his small tackle box and their fishing rods. He saw which way they had ran. He followed the trail through the brush and as he guessed he did run through a massive thorn bush and through some trees. Deciding it would be better to just get to the road he started walking again till he heard his dad's voice yelling his name. After a few seconds he saw his dad and his sister hauling ass to him down the trail. He hugged my dad asking what the hell happened. My dad said he didn't know and that he was sorry he lost his sister. My dad's sister said she doesn't know why they started running, just that my dad started screaming and bolted and that they had gotten separated. She decided to run home but got lost and ended up walking away from town and only realized when someone finally drove past her and picked her up and drove her home. None of them know what happened or why they ran and my dad still can't remember anything that happened before he got to the road. I have a little story I thought was interesting out in Colorado. For some background, I'm a 19-year-old army engineer stationed in Fort Carson, Colorado. A month ago, we were doing a battalion-level field exercise for a week. The first night we stayed out in the middle of nowhere as a platoon before moving in with the rest of the battalion. We barely had sleep and were exhausted, but nonetheless we had to do guard the area, that's where it happened. Get picked for the two half-hour night shift between 1.30 a.m. and 3 a.m. Pissed because it was already 12.50 a.m. and we just gotten back from a reconnaissance mission up a big-ass hill. Sleep for about 10 minutes before being woken up by the current guards talking and then shift change. Do my shift with another soldier, let's call him Gary. Gary was in much longer than I was, I was only at Carson for a few months while he was in for three years. We walk around and did our rounds, talking and stuff about how shitty the field is. We had NVGs, and every now and then we'd flip them down to see what was up. Around the edge of the northeast side of the secure point when we hear soft shuffling behind the bushes. We go quiet and put on our NVGs. Shitty grainy quality, we see a figure in the bushes, hunched over laying low. Think it's the opposing force, another company was selected to play them and we were told they would be hostile. We raise our weapons, useless, Blanks and a firing adapter meant no live ammo, tell the figure to identify itself or else force will be used. The thing just stops moving, surprised it was noticed. We realize it wasn't facing us when the figure turns its head, something long and horse-like in shape, no detail cause of shitty NVGs and darkness. Got two little glowing eyes like a deer or a cat, blinks once at us and stares for a few moments. I shit you not, the thing fucking lunges out away from us with no sort of noise or force, we only made out the blur from it leaping in the air to the hill in front of us. We were both freaked out and try to find the figure again, but the hill was huge and we climbed it twice that day in full kit, we didn't feel like doing it again. We head back and wake our platoon sergeant what we found. He tells us that it was just probably a bird, and that we were seeing things because we've barely slept and ate. He says to finish with the security. We have about 35 minutes left till the next shift. We do as we were told and head back out the perimeter again, a little shaken up but trying to justify what we've seen. We don't talk much as before, only brushing on Gary's ETS and my goals for schools. The hill was huge, it was hard not to notice. We kept wondering what the fuck we saw leap there in one go for 300 meters. Nothing else happens, we head back to the main area and wake up the next shift. Go to pick a spot to sleep in a striker, a big armored carrier. It has thermal optics for a 50 calories, and even though it was on it wasn't being manned because the gunner had to leave the field for appointments. I hop into the seat and mess around with the camera, not really knowing how it works. Switch the thermals to white hot and black hot, move it around, zoom in, all that. I want to look at the hill, wanna see if that thing was there. Point and zoom out, taking the hill and panning the camera on black hot. Lo and behold, I see a figure on the very top, 
next to a dead tree. The tree was big, when we climbed the hill earlier that day it was a marking point because how big it is. The thing was nearly half the fucking size of it. It was big, maybe about eight feet or so in height. The legs, arms, whatever, were super skinny. They showed up as white in the thermals, meaning it had no heat. The only thing that had heat was its center torso and patches along its head. The head was more defined now, long like a horse or deer. Very skinny as well, but not enough resolution to show definition of fur slash skin. The thing stands up and looks up at the sky, just looking up for about a minute. Just watch on the camera, staying quiet so I won't get in trouble, wondering what the fuck it was. Its head suddenly snaps towards me, facing directly into the camera. I know it's looking at me because the eyes are showing up as black dots in its head, meaning heat. It super lunges again down to the base of the hill and zooms through the little plain between us and the hill, then suddenly stops before a small river there, surrounding the hill. Watch as it slowly crawls itself into the stream and sink, watching me in the camera until it sinks its head completely. Thermals can capture heat in water, but there was nothing underneath the surface to show it. Suddenly what sounded like my squad leader knocks on the hatch to open the striker. Anon, open the fucking door. It's cold, Anon. I open the door, lowering the ramp, but see no one there. Realize that squad leader was in the other striker as he had the first shift from 12 to 1.30, he didn't come with us to the hill earlier. There was some shuffling in the bushes not far from the striker. Nope it and close the hatch. I don't say anything at all. Put in my ear pro, pulled my fleece cap down to cover my eyes and wrap myself in a blanket trying to comfort myself. No dreams. Two hours later I get woken up to do personal hygiene before we meet up with battalion. Meet up with Gary, he looks sleepless, ask what's wrong. Said he had a nightmare but doesn't go into depth, kinda avoids me until the next day. Head over to the stream for hygiene and to see where the thing went. Look around, the stream's completely empty and still minus a few pieces of Marie trash. It doesn't look deep either, grab a stick about four feet long and prod it in the center. Only goes up to a foot at the deepest, it barely goes up a few inches with the rest. This was the area the thing went into, but it was too shallow for something that big. Think about the sergeant asking me to open the door. Decide not to fuck with this shit anymore and focus on the task on hand, not some monster demon. Pick related is the stream. This was in the first day of the field. The rest of the time we were busy doing shit so I didn't really dwell about it. The only reason why I bring it up now is that an old friend whose infantry went on a field problem. She was telling me about some weird shit she saw her first night there. It was eerily similar to my story. The Red Ghost, also known as Phantasma Colorado, is a cryptid and a well-known legend of Arizona. The Red Ghost appears as a very large, demonically hideous camel-like creature, with a human skeleton tied to its back. The story begins back in 1883 at a lonely ranch near Eagle Creek in southeastern Arizona. The Apache Wars were drawing to a close. However, a few renegade bands were on the prowl, keeping isolated ranches in a constant state of siege. Early one morning, two men rode out to check on the livestock leaving their wives at the ranch with the children. About mid-morning, one of the women went down to the spring to fetch a bucket of water while the other remained in the house with the children. Suddenly one of the dogs began to bark ferociously. The woman inside the house heard a terrifying scream. Looking out the window, she saw a huge, reddish-hued beast run by with a devilish-looking creature strapped on its back. The frightened woman barricaded herself in the house and waited anxiously for the men to return. That night they found the body of the other woman, trampled to death. Next day tracks were found, cloven hoof prints much larger than those of a horse, along with long strands of reddish hair. A few days later, a party of prospectors near Clifton were awakened by the sound of thundering hoofs and ear-piercing screams. Their tent collapsed, 
and the men clawed their way out of the tangle just in time to see a gigantic creature run off in the moonlight. The next day, they too, found huge cloven hoof prints and long, red strands of hair clinging to the brush. Naturally these stories grew and were embellished by local raconteurs. One man claimed he saw the beast kill and eat a grizzly bear. Another insisted he had chased the red ghost, only to have it disappear before his eyes. A few months after the incident with the miners, Cyrus Hamblin, a rancher on the Salt River, rode up on the animal while rounding up cows. Hamblin recognized the beast as a camel, with something tied to its back that resembled the skeleton of a man. Although Hamblin had a reputation as an honest man and one not given to tall tales, many refused to believe his story. Several weeks later, over on the Verd River, the camel was spotted again, this time by another group of prospectors. They, too, saw something attached to the animal's back. Grabbing their weapons they fired at the camel but missed. The animal bolted and ran, causing a piece of the strange object to fall to the ground. What the miners saw made the hair bristle on their necks. On the ground lay a human skull with some parts of flesh and hair still attached. A few days later, the red ghost struck again. This time the victims were teamsters camped beside a lonely road. They said they were awakened in the middle of the night by a loud scream. According to the terrified drivers, a creature at least 30 feet tall knocked over two freight wagons and generally raised hell with the camp. The men ran for their lives and hid in the brush. Returning the next day, they found cloven hoof prints and red strands of hair. About a year later, a cowboy near Phoenix came upon the red ghost eating grass in a corral. Traditionally, cowboys have been unable to resist the temptation to rope anything that wears hair, and this fellow was no exception. He built a fast loop in his rope and tossed it over the camel's head. Suddenly the angry beast turned and charged. The cowboy's horse tried to dodge, but to no avail. Horse and rider went down, and as the camel galloped off in a cloud of dust, the astonished cowboy recognized the skeletal remains of a man lashed to its back. During the next few years, stories of the red ghost grew to legendary proportions. The creature made its last appearance nine years later in eastern Arizona. A rancher awoke one morning and saw the huge animal casually grazing in his garden. He drew a careful bead with his trusty Winchester and dropped the beast with one shot. An examination of the corpse convinced all that this was indeed the fabled red ghost. The animal's back was heavily scarred from rawhide strips that had been used to tie down the body of a man. Some of the leather strands had cut into the camel's flesh. But how the human body came to be attached to the back of the camel remains a cruel mystery. I hope that you enjoyed tonight's broadcast. If you enjoyed tonight's story, then please subscribe to the channel as more green texts will appear daily. A new broadcast will appear when the clock strikes. Midnight Central Time.